Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where you are on this spinning orb called Earth. Sad to report, still wrapped in a pandemic. Um, in the United States, it can feel kind of cozy right now as we're getting back into the ball games and life as we knew it. Uh, I just like to remind everyone every day on this podcast, when this webcast, when I do it, that there's still more than not, more than seven billion people with a B, seven billion, who have yet to see a single shot, let alone two. And we have a long way to go to crafting a post-pandemic planet. Now, today's discussion is about something other than that, as you can see by the uh, window that's open. I'm just going to add Seth uh, Showstack to the show here too. Hey, Seth, hold on a second. I'm just going to, you, you're muting for a second. And we're going to talk about, uh, well, obviously UFOs, UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, which is uh, the new acronym and name in the media. And uh, as of today, also USOs, uh, un Unidentified s Submerged Objects. Uh, Keith Kluwer has a piece up on the latest videos coming out. Um, these are not new issues. They're many, many decades of issues about things around us that are inexplicable. Of course, this goes back through human history, the idea of the inexplicable, um, unidentified, uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Uh, this relates to what I do here because what I'm trying to do in this webcast is foster um, some sense of where do you go amid uncertainty and complexity? And how do you craft rational discourse when so many of our tools and systems, including the media, tend to be set up to uh, either distract us, uh, divide us, or sometimes actively confuse us. So it's a great show today. You've seen this clip, I'm sure, somewhere. This is Voice of America. And it's worth just having one little revisit to this. It's um, from quite a long time ago, as you'll hear, but it uh, keeps resurfacing. There's fresh video today we'll talk about too, as well. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. In this video, taken from a US Navy jet, we hear crew reacting to what appears to be a craft flying at high speed and in astonishing ways. The video comes from a covert Pentagon task force established in 2007 and charged with collecting and analyzing encounters with what are now known as Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, or UAP. So we'll, we'll get back into some visuals, but I just want to introduce you to today's uh, guests here on my webcast. This is Sustain What? It's uh, broadcast courtesy of Columbia University's Earth Institute and Climate School, which is the new phenomenon where I work. I'm Andy Revkin, longtime journalist, uh, and I've focused on different kinds of inexplicable events uh, from plane crashes to, uh, well, you'll hear more in a few minutes. Uh, but today's guests are Keith Kluwer, who is a longtime journalist on the same kind of journey I've been on, trying to navigate and convey to the public understanding, including understanding what we don't understand. And Keith has some pieces, has written extensively on the UFO phenomenon in the last couple of years. Uh, hold on one second, I'm gonna show slides to introduce uh, the, my other guests here too as well. One moment. Uh, my own producer, so this is a, as low tech <laughs> as one of those low tech um, uh, YouTube channels you might be watching occasionally, especially if you're into issues like the ones we're talking about. Oh, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So today also with me is Kate Dorsch, who's a science historian, recent PhD uh, dissertation achievement. <laughs> Congratulations on that. And I understand a book is in the works. The PhD is Reliable Witnesses Crackpot Science UFO Investigations in Cold War America, 1947 through 1977. You've been very active on Twitter and uh, you're deeply dug into the backstory, not just of what might be going on, but the conversation around what is going on. Uh, we have Sarah Scholes, who's a journalist and author of They Are Already Here, UFO Culture and Why We See Saucers, who also focused on the important question of perception and how these phenomena fit into our preconceived sense of who we are and where we fit in society. And Seth Shostak, who is a senior astronomer at SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Project. Uh, great to be to see you again. It's been a very long time. So uh, let's start with Keith, because really it was some pieces you've been doing that 
prompted me to dig in on this issue. Uh, what's going on here? And we're going to focus, I think, as much as we can on the interface between the media and the actual information. What's your sense of the story? I'm going to show you, I'll show people one of your pieces in a second. Oh, you can unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, so, uh, geez, where to start on this? Um, for me, uh, I've sort of periodically dipped into this, you know, over the last few years, you know, initially 2017, 2018, when, uh, when I was prompted by that first big New York Times front page story that um, revealed this um, semi-secretive you know, UFO Pentagon program that um, was a little, we're still trying to, you know, suss that out. And so, but that was, that was big news. And, you know, a lot of media picked up on that. And you had some former Pentagon officials that were uh, prominently featured in that in, in uh, 2017, 2018. And so that this, all the stories that we're seeing now actually first came to light then. And only in, I'd say in the last um, couple of months, as you know, as sort of you know, this has picked up steam. There's been some more videos that have been released. There's been some action on you know on on the Capitol Hill, asking for reports about these these UFOs or or uh, UFOs. Um, basically, you know, they just one story begets another. There's you know new new developments. You know, usually superficial uh, announcements like the last few weeks of leaked videos that have appeared. Uh, on NBC and ABC and CNN. And then the, what happens is the Pentagon comes out with a statement and says, yes, we, we, can, we can confirm that these, this video was taken you know, by one of our, you know, by a Navy pilot. And basically you take that and run with the story you know, as we've been seeing play out. And it just, it sort of builds on itself. You, you had some big, big you know, treatments, you know, 60 Minutes did a big show and uh the new yorker did a big article right. and uh you know so it, it, for me what's been interesting and 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 uh this is something that sarah has picked up on sarah skulls mm -hmm. is that it's essentially the same people that have that are showing up in all these stories the same handful of ufo enthusiasts or in some cases lobbyists since 2017 and then every few months they show up with a new video or some new, you know, peg, and it gets a whole new cycle starts up in the media, and we're in one of those now. We're in a big one now for the last few weeks. And there's actually a UFO PAC. There's a political action committee for UFOs. Yeah, now. that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Of course. So uh, let's circle around here and just get an initial take from from each of you. Um, so, Kate, you, you know, you're, with your skill set and your interest in history and and how it relates to current events, you could have been studying anything. What what drew you into this this field? Yeah, why UFOs? Um, so I am a historian of science with a specialization in expertise and knowledge making processes. So like UFOs, obviously, um, but really what it is about this particular situation, this history, this story um, is that a, UFOs seem to persist throughout the Cold War. Now we're in the sort of post-Cold War period and they haven't really changed very much. The other thing about the current developments, the conversations, the discourse, the controversies, now this upcoming report, is that all of this has been seen before for me and very little of it looks new or different. It's actually striking to me when the mid-December reporting broke, um, how closely aligned the things that Luis Elizondo, for example, was saying um, to things that were said in the mid 60s by Edward Ruppelt, an Air Force captain who was the first director of Project Blue Book, the same sorts of critiques being leveraged, not enough time, not enough resources, not enough personnel, not enough interest from the higher ups for something that should be very important and serious to us. Right. Um, and so I got involved in this whole thing, A, through a sort of philosophical interest in how we know things, both as professional scientists and average Americans. Um, but the UFO thing seems to tap into so many different pieces of this and seems to persist and really demonstrate the importance of keeping history in mind when we look at situations like this. The pattern that we've been through this before. Yeah, time, yeah, and, time is a flat circle, as I keep saying. 
And it's the same narrative. I mean, yeah. they were posing a national security threat in the 1950s and 1960s. The same same UFOs. They're they're, they're and and some of the same stories. They are disabling our our uh, what of our, our our nuclear facilities or something like that. I mean, yeah. they, they mean basically the same cases that were you know trotted out in the 1950s and 1960s have just been recycled today and since 2017 and up till now. I mean, there's no difference, literally. It's, and, and, it's really disorienting sometimes. And, and Sarah, just let's get into your perspective too then. Um, what, why this, you know, again, as a, a science journalist, you could write about any number of wonderful things. And this is, it's one of those morasses where again, the things we don't know seem to out outnumber the things we do gets us into this I, I, I have this aphorism. It's almost like a law of physics. Uh, uh, an absence of evidence leads to a paucity, uh, to an overabundance of assertion. And this seems to be one of those cases. So wh why, why for you is this a big issue? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I hadn't really thought very much about UFOs at all until around the same time that Keith did when the big 2017 New York Times story came out. And, you know, like a lot of people, I thought, here's this serious newspaper, these serious journalists um, addressing this topic that has been so fringe. And so um, in reading that story carefully, I just I just wanted to initially, you know, try to confirm or fail to confirm the things that were in it. And that kind of sent me on a journey of talking to people like historians, sociologists, anthropologists um, about exactly the things that that Kate was talking about, these cycles that repeat and why UFOs seem to just persist and persist in the, in the public consciousness in these waves. And so um, like like a lot of people, I kind of got sucked into the UFO wormhole and <laughs> had to write a book because uh, I found too much for for articles just about the, the role that UFOs play in mostly in people's personal lives, but also in in the public ecosystem and why it is that we remain uh, on average so interested in them. And I assume we'll get into lots of those topics as the conversation goes on. We will. So and Seth, so Seth Shostak, you've been searching for extraterrestrial life out there for decades, right? And I know you've gotten pulled into this arena of what's happening possibly here too. There also was um, a paper by Gavin Schmidt and Adam Frank were looking at whether there were had seriously assessing whether there might've been alien visits to the earth before modern times and that there's some kind of was presence here. So Seth, what drew you, I guess it's, un, is it unavoidable that you would get sucked into the idea that they're, they are here among us? Oh, you're 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 muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe I muted you because when you first got on. Hold on one second. Okay. You are unmuted. I've been, well, this is the first Never time ended. in many years that I've been unmuted. Yeah. Well, getting sucked in already is an editorial comment about the phenomenon. But you know, I I for probably twenty or thirty years I've gotten uh, emails every day from people who are having difficulties with aliens in their personal lives or have witnessed something that they think should be investigated. So in that sense, yes, I've been involved. And of course, I answer these. And I, I, I guess I know most of the people in the UFO field because I've been to conferences where they've been the majority of the speakers and I'm sort of the skeptic. One thing I, I will point out, there's been a lot of reference here to the sociological implications of all this. And, uh, you know, aside from the fact that I very often get angry uh, emails from people who want to come and throttle me. I mean, that happens anyhow, but in this case, it's because of the UFO crowd. You know, I, I will say that the sociology is indeed very interesting in the sense that people get very, very worked up about this, right? If you say, ah, you know, I don't think that these uh, phenomena that people are reporting have anything to do with alien craft then suddenly you're a mortal enemy for these people. And that isn't true in almost any other debate in science. So there is that. The other thing I'd like to point out, well, while I'm thinking of things to point out, is that if the aliens really are here, if they're you know buzzing the skies and occasionally hauling people out of their bedrooms for these unauthorized experiments, if they're doing that, they are the best house guests ever. They don't kill anybody. They don't do anything. They don't help us, right? I mean, are they, gonna, are they working on climate change? Are they really buzzing our missile silos? I mean, wouldn't that be 
like me going back to the time of the Neanderthals and only being interested where they where they fashioned the big sticks that they use against one another. It doesn't make any sense to me. None of it makes any sense, but it doesn't violate physics. It's possible to go from one star system to another. It's extremely difficult. But, you know, who knows what a society a million years more advanced than ours could do. So you can't rule it out that way. I think the way you can rule it out is simply by the nature of the evidence. So it's, and again, the percolation and social media, I, actually the advent of social media makes these things so much more percolatable. But, but then here it is on 60 Minutes. And, and yeah, and yeah, no, no, that's true. But that's because the current argument by those who are partial to the idea that we are being visited is to rely on something they call disclosure. There's a disclosure project. There's this disclosure. Many of them speak of this because they realize the public is a little tired of the old stories. Nobody wants to hear about Roswell anymore. It's a perfectly logical explanation for Roswell anyhow, and they don't like that. But mm -hmm. now they put all their eggs, it seems to me, in one basket. The government is going to come out and prove that what we've been saying all along is true. I don't think that's going to happen. But this is what's known as an argument from ignorance, right? No, well, I invented the uh, cure for cancer, but I can't tell you about it. Not right. a very good argument. <laughs> Um, could I jump in and say something about things like the 60 Minutes coverage? I think it's important to consider from the journalism perspective that, you know, big flashy stories are not always responding to public interest. They are also creating public interest in the fact that we're seeing a wave of coverage right now in the wake of, of the 60 Minutes segment and things like the giant New Yorker story is not necessarily because we have determined that the public interest exists, but because those things created incentives for journalists to write more stories. If UFOs are a trending topic, somebody's editor is gonna say, why don't you go write about this thing that the internet says everybody cares about? And then the internet starts to care about it and more people start writing about it. And it's, it's just kind of a self-sustaining cycle. Sorry, you're absolutely right. I, I just did an interview the other day with uh, some journalists from Sweden uh, or, you know, I think they refer to themselves as sort of the NPR of Sweden. I haven't seen the segment yet. But he had said to me, the producer uh, that I spoke with, said that, you know, we're only doing this because the New York Times, and we saw the, the articles in the New York Times and NPR, so we're thinking, you know, there must be something to this. Now, of course, they're going to check it out, and they're going to see that, you know, the, this, this, you know, this story has been, has been building for some time. But I think they were prompted by, by these big, flashy stories on 60 Minutes. He did say 60 Minutes and and uh, and the New Yorker specifically, because these are, are serious media. And so if it's on there, then other journalists are going to perk up and say, well, you know, we should we should look into this, too. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a self-sustaining loop. Yeah, yeah, Kate. Absolutely. Yeah, and I just want to jump in and say that, like, I was working on this before 2017. I started my formal research into this in, in 20 B gosh, the fall of 2014, sort of recreationally, if you will, and then seriously in 2015. And at the time in 2015, while obviously I had supporters in our discipline that were like gung-ho for this project and this work, a number of senior colleagues cautioned me against doing it, that no one would take me seriously if I pursued some sort of serious history of science of UFOs that there, this UFO taboo thing is real, which is why ne right now in 2021, I'm a little, I'm a little bit more cagey about like acknowledging that there is some sort of substantial taboo holding people back. Um, only because I did sort of experience that, went ahead with it anyways, and found the work roundly and warmly accepted by all kinds of communities, including the UFO community, um, who have been an incredibly helpful group when I need them to be. So, yeah, you know, it, it's it's something else, I guess. And a lot of this interest right now is sort of being driven by media coverage. I found the same thing, too, for what it was worth. I was worried about writing a UFO book, after, I mean, in the years after um, you started working, because, you know, I mostly write about satellites or astronomy or other things. And uh like to think of myself as at least fairly serious. And I thought, what, what is going to happen when I try to interview people for stories about, you know, nuclear space propulsion if they see that I wrote a UFO book? But I found, for the most part, that people are just interested um, and, and curious, if not from the side of, uh, you know, alien spacecraft visiting Earth, then, then from the human side of why people are interested in this. So there are some questions coming in from uh, readerships, re viewership, viewers here. Hold on a second. Uh, 
<clears throat> here, um, so this questioner from YouTube says, what I don't understand is the last point that Seth made you're willing to concede that there are civilizations that could, again, be a million years ahead of us in technology, et cetera, or some group far ahead of our progress can be. So that could be, here's the second part of it. Um, so why do we have this attitude that now in the last few decades, we've arrived at the end of knowledge? Yeah, it, well, well, I'm sorry. That, that, that's actually a good question. Uh, but it presupposes that somehow we've reached, as has been called, the end of science. And I don't think that you'll find that attitude from many scientists, right? I mean, you know, I'm in astronomy, but you know, we haven't reached the end of astronomy any more than we've, you know, seen the Big Bang. I mean, we've seen some things right. from the Big Bang, but there's plenty of more to go. But I think the point in terms of the conversation today is simply that the, you know, the supposition that we are being visited doesn't violate physics. You can go to the other side of the galaxy, even with a NASA rocket. You could do that. It's just that it would take you many, many millions of years to do so, right? Okay, but the point is only that, well, that sounds like a long ride just sitting in a middle seat and eating peanuts, but it isn't impossible, right? So you right. have to evaluate the UFO question, if what you want to do is decide whether there's any truth to it, uh, on the basis of the evidence, not on the basis of saying it's it's unlikely or un are impossible. Okay, hold on, I'm just trying to sort through these a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna get my laptop charger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, by the way, while I'm searching through these, if anyone wants to weigh in with another point, uh, that's fine. Uh, um, I'll I'll add that I kind of I kind of think of the the alien or the extraterrestrial hypothesis as an explanation for unidentified things in the sky as a, a sort of god of the gaps situation where you know we have maybe some sometimes people see things or people do see things sometimes that they themselves cannot explain but we don't have evidence in the positive direction of aliens as an explanation it's just kind of something that fills the gap of our knowledge um and i think at least for me to start con considering that as a as a very viable hypothesis we would need to have something that indicates that as an explanation not just something that doesn't indicate something else yeah that, that that's the argument from ignorance thing that, you know <laughs> right. i can't you know there's good evidence but unfortunately i can't show it to you but you know there are plenty of other things that should have shown evidence of visitation if we're being visited there are something like four thousand five hundred you know, satellites that are still alive orbiting the earth. Okay, most of them are doing things not relevant to here, but about 750 of them are looking down. And you know that, you see the, you know, the weather right. uh, uh, imagery on, on the news at night. And you can just go to Google Earth, right? And find your house and you'll see your car parked outside, right? It right. obviously has enough resolution to see a car, right? And in fact, of course there's satellites which have considerably more resolution, we don't necessarily see that imagery. But, you know, if there are things flying around, why don't we see that from those data? And you can say, oh, well, the government is, you know, suppressing that imagery. Well, maybe they are. I used to work for the government. I don't think they're very good at keeping secrets, but that's neither here nor there. It has to be true for the entire world, because the United States is not the only government that has this capability. Right. So on that point, Seth, and I, I just wanted to point out something. What, what's been astonishing about all this coverage about these UFOs supposedly encroaching military airspace, U.S. military airspace, for not, not just occasionally, but if you were to believe the reports you see on 60 Minutes and, and, and other programs, it's, it's every day for weeks, for months, for years even. And right. it just, it, it really? And then why only here? So they're only is it is it they're just interested in our military facilities? They're only they're, they're only they're only trolling our navy pilots. What about yeah, the rest well, of the world? Well, that's right. That's absolutely right, Keith. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And their interest in our military doesn't make any sense either. Because if they have the technology to come here, right, they're way beyond uh, our level of technology. So how interested are you in the technology that the Romans had for building machines of war? 
you know, big, big movable platform so that they could get over a wall or whatever, <laughs> right? You would say, look, I'm really not interested in that. I want to know what caused the decline of the Roman Empire. I want to know, you know, something more about Cicero. I don't know what you'd want. But the idea that you would spend all your time looking at missile silos, it, 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 it seems very strain, don't you think? Historians uh, of technology everywhere we. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing in the perspective of Christopher Mellon, who I, I reached out to. I wish I had reached out to him with more time, advanced time. Um, he said he couldn't make this show on short notice, but he did send me a note. Uh, so let me just read it here. He's uh, been highly visible. Uh, he's involved with the pack that started. He helped to surface some of the other people who were involved with getting the story out. And and he says, I know why and how the issue has gotten back on the front pages. It happened because a couple of determined former insiders were able to provide Congress and the press with authoritative information demonstrating that one or more actors are routinely violating U US airspace. And in some cases, the vehicles involved, e.g. the Tic Tac, of course, the Tic Tac being that 40 foot uh, Tic Tac shaped object that's so agile, uh, are demonstrating revolutionary technology that defies both our understanding of science as well as our engineering capabilities. Of course, that does not prove the existence of aliens, exclamation point. Who is claiming that, question mark? I thought people were he claiming is. that. I know, <laughs> well, anyway, oh, certainly yeah, I, not I, me. I, I, Let me just finish the statement. All certainly right. not me or DOD or Congress. Skeptics and believers alike need to check their prejudices at the door and follow the facts. It's all about the data. Good luck with your discussion. So, all right. I, I got I to gotta jump in on that. So first of all, okay. Chris is speaking with a forked tongue here um, because all you have to do is go to his some of his recent tweets. He's even He even speculates. He even says, I think the, yesterday he was responding to Mick West, uh, who was, you know, a challenge, who, who had, uh, had a, written a really good op-ed in, in USA Today, um, making some of the same points uh, and others that, that Seth has been making here. Uh, Chris has said in a tweet, the le his leading theory for one of the most popular videos known as the Tic Tac is the, is the alien, uh, ultra, -ter I think it's called ultra terrestrial hypothesis. That's his leading theory. The other, so let's just, you know, you can, and that's not me. He says that in a tweet. Right. The other thing that I want to make clear is that since this all happened since 2017 or actually earlier since 2016. Chris Mellon has actually been sort of the architect, the guy behind the scenes, who's really responsible for all this media. And then, you know, he he's recruited people. The first one he recruited is is Leslie Keene, um, who was a blogger at the Huffington Post and who's written, who's been a long time UFO enthusiast, um, very much a believer. Uh, and, you know, she, you know, he gave her the inside scoop on when all this was forming when Chris and Louis Elizondo and others joined up with Tom DeLong, uh, the uh, former rock star, to start this uh, organization called To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. They actually, they actually reveal that, you, you know, this is something that these guys talk about um, a lot about the, the whole idea of, you know, I don't know, I, you just have to go back and watch this, this, this video, this launch video from I think it's from October of 2017. And you have to watch Tom DeLong talk about how he was contacted by all these former government insiders. This is a guy um, who has been hunting UFOs and Bigfoot for decades. And they decide, Chris Mellon and Louis Elizondo decide to join up with this guy. They don't join up with a, a staid think tank. They don't join up with RAND. They don't join up with, a, with any aerospace experts. They join up with a kooky rock star who nobody took seriously about any of this um, before actually they hooked up with him. And then, and then, so, uh, and then they, they loop in uh, Leslie Kane who wrote a couple of very uh, wide eyed blog posts and uh, blog posts and the Huffington Post in October of 2017. And then two months later, somehow or another, she convinces your old newspaper, Andy, to do this, to do this time story about it. And and they and they conveniently omit the connection. They 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 whitewash the whole Tom DeLong connection and the connection to TTSA. And then it centers on Louis Elizondo. And then since that time, the last point I want to make is since that time, while they have been really good about cultivating all this mainstream media attention, 
at the same time, there's been an alternative, you know, channel. They have been cultivating uh, a relationship with every UFO blogger, every every everybody in alternative media. You can go every single day and watch a podcast, uh, either a radio or a video podcast with Luis Elizondo or, or Chris Mellon, and they are just all the time talking up, talking this subject up with people in the UFO world. Why would you do that? Why would you do that if you just want to take the, if you just want this to be a, you know, a national security issue and not about aliens, you don't want to, you don't want to include the, the alien box. You want to take it out of there. I don't get that. Why, why, why loop all these people in who have been, who have, who spout every kind of crazy conspiracy theory about this stuff? It makes no sense to me. I, I have never understood that. I would love, I would have loved for Chris to explain that public relations strategy. Like why, if you want to be taken seriously, are you, are you cultivating this, this, this loony crowd? Yeah, you, you can, you can talk about all this till the, you know, till the bovines return Shea new. Uh, and I think that's good. I think he makes some important points, but from the standpoint of just looking at it, you know, from a science point of view, that he, he, there was a big pachyderm in the room that he ignored. He made all these statements about the Tic Tac video, assuming that it was actually a physical thing, right? And, and, and it may very well be, but let me just suggest an alternative explanation. You have these infrared gun sight cameras. They're sensitive to heat. Anything that looks black on the screen is something hot. And it looks like a peanut, okay, or a Tic Tac. Imagine that there's a two engine jet two miles in front of the Navy jet, right? And you're just looking up the tailpipes of that jet. What are you going to see? You're going to see a peanut, peanut shaped object on, on the videos. I mean, it's, you know, it's not impossible. There was another airplane in front of the one you saw because they only give you the video that's interesting. It doesn't mean that, and, and it, it might be internal reflections in the camera. You know, these things only happen uh, in certain cases and all these good videos you know, are made from F-18 Hornets and mostly with the same cameras. And it's like finding Bigfoot. Anybody can find Bigfoot as long as you're driving, uh, you know, a, a, a Chevy car through the Pacific Northwest, you know, with a certain kind of windshield. It's kind of strange. It's just That's strange an interesting point. Yeah. So, so back to uh, Sarah and to Kate on, um, I'd like to widen out here too, because some of this reminds me of how, well, during the pandemic, the questions about masks or about the vaccine or about chloroquine, you ended up with sort of semi-serious people grouped with total whack jobs. And I don't know whether you, either Sarah from the standpoint of journalism or uh, Kate and thinking about this in context of history, see some, a pattern here beyond the UFO phenomenon. Um, I mean, I think, I'm not sure if this ex is exactly the question, but I think with UFOs, as with a lot of scientific topics that become politicized or political, people have an identity that associates with UFOs. Like in, in my research for my book, I found that your association with a, you know, a crowd of believers or a group of UFO believers who believe a specific thing about UFOs you know, you you get a lot of identity and community from that, and then you become united against the people who don't believe you, which gets at some of the things people uh, were earlier saying um, about the way that you are the devil if you don't think the same thing about UFOs as, as other people. And so it becomes as much about um, how you think of yourself personally in relationship to UFOs as it does about what the actual evidence says about UFOs. Yeah, and to speak to this from, from the historical perspective, uh, this sort of the balance of credibility, quote unquote, semi-serious, or in many cases, serious people who become involved in what is then perceived as an unserious topic, um, goes all the way back to the beginning. J. Allen Hynek, the ufologist ufologist, um, is highly critical of Kenneth Arnold, who has the sort of Ur sighting in 1947, um, because Arnold is very prevalent in the press. He's very visible. He's taking his story to all the news media. It does change slightly over time. He writes a book and starts making money off his story. And this degrades his credibility in the eyes of, quote, unquote, serious UFO people who in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s are frequently professionally trained scientists, atmospheric physicists, astronomers, and so on. Um, and so 
the UFO question historically has always generated a lot of its, not only its lasting power, but its, I think, attraction to the public by being peopled with people who we think are more credible than average, serious people who have expertise in this case even for something like To the Stars, right? Like they tout on the front page, their scientists who are involved, former CIA and government officials, et cetera, because these are people we should trust, right? These aren't just anybody off the street. And this has always been used um, in, in addressing the UFO problem to say, right? Like whether you are the Air Force with Project Blue Book, for example, drawing university scientists into your investigations or, um, whether you're Donald Kehoe's NICAP, the National Investigations Committee for Aerial Phenomena from the 50s and 60s. Kehoe's a former Navy guy, right? Who, who collects government officials and former military officials as well. And these things grant credibility um, to the work that you are doing. And you, your work looks more serious because the people doing that work is more serious. Uh, it's a way of sort of generating controversy or credibility. On the other hand, to speak to your previous question, Andy, about um, why you're also, and Keith's point about why you're reaching out to these blogs and like every single other person. Um, I did get the chance to read um, Brian Bender's piece from this morning from Politico um, about, and he draws our attention to the fact that for as much as To The Stars is doing like trying to fund technological research and scientific research, they're also an entertainment company. Um, and it's sort of a double-edged blade, right? You have to keep the lights on, but what is this entertainment side of this doing to what you are purporting to be serious science? Right. Yeah. And I think uh, r related to both Chris Mellon's point about you know this being a few government insiders coming forward and combining Kate's point about uh, you know, positions of authority and how we think of them as they relate to unserious, uh, traditionally unserious topics. This whole wave, as Keith said earlier, has been largely created by a, a very small group of, of people, these few government insiders that, that Chris Mellon uh, spoke of and also Tom DeLong, who have succeeded largely in making it seem like the entire government is worried about UFOs every day all the time and really it's the it's a few videos and it's it seems to be a few people that that have created this course that seems maybe much larger than it is it's an interesting point i i want to throw up the um well here's the piece that you were just talking about brian bender's story which i think gets at that idea that we're overplaying we being the media are overplaying a very small cluster of sort of uh, narrative builders Keith, did you want to weigh in on that? Oh, you're muted. I haven't. I haven't read. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't read that story yet. But but um, I know Brian's been on on this beat. You know, he he had a, a story. He's he's been uh, reporting on on these developments since uh, 2017. Um, yeah, I I think I, I think for me, uh, it has been striking to see the sort of the lack of of historic you know and forget about what happened you know 50 40 50 years ago I, I can't expect you know journalists you know to 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 be up to date you know with with that history um it would be nice if, if you wanted to come back and 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 sort of you know delve into it um more, you know more comprehensively but you know i i i just i just can't get over the sort of how how shallow the coverage has been, you know, really since 2017. It's there's it's I, I've never seen so much, so much, so many headlines, so much stories and produced from what? Like like some of some of the folks on here have been saying, just a few videos and and just just a few people who have been really, really, really adept at working the media from the get-go. And as Seth says, well, you know, the old aphorism about extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, how do you actually do those things? What are these devices? Uh, that that statement from Christopher, Christopher Mellon was about vehicles, like presuming the fact of that. And if this is so consequential to humanity, where's the National Academy of Sciences, <laughs> for example? 
uh, we, where are not, these? Not, yeah, absolutely, Andy. And not only that, I haven't seen, this is something I brought out, I, and, and I'm not saying this would, this, it, it can only be legitimate if a certain subset of journalists cover it, but one of the striking things about this is that you don't see anybody, any reputable reporters in the national, you know, covering, you know, the defense beat, and in the intelligence community, you never see them writing about this. You only see, you know, uh, general reporters and enterprise reporters. So for, as you just said, for something so consequential, if our airspace is being invaded by mysterious objects so frequently, I mean, it, it, as some some folks have in this circle have suggested, it's it, it suggests a massive intelligence failure. Where are the where are the journalists? Who, who know the intelligence community inside and out, that have great sources in there. Where, where is the aerospace and aviation press? You don't see them anywhere. They want nothing to do with this story. Well, I so, mean, you could, you, 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 could, you could go a little farther and say, where's the FAA? If I go down to the local airport, you know, one of 100,000 flights per day, 100,000 flights per day worldwide, a couple fewer right. now in the Ukraine, but or I guess it's Belarus, Never mind. In any case, you know, if there, there are objects up there that haven't filed a flight plan because they're from Proxima Centauri, right? don't you think I would be a little worried about getting on that plane? I mean, there's that. I'll mention one other thing here since, uh, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of amateur astronomers around the world. And they go out, I mean, you know, Sarah knows this, they go out if the night is clear and take a look at the stars. But if they're looking at the planets and so forth, that means they're in, in the aggregate over a year, they're looking at fairly random parts of the sky. And these people are very adept at recognizing what they see through their telescopes. And you don't get any reports of these alien craft. And if you just work the numbers, which I did one afternoon, you know, they should see these things a couple of times a week based on the the uh, frequency of reports. Also, the Air Force has been remarkably quiet about all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Which, well, in, the Air Force uh, to disentangle itself at some point, um, and I suspect it's not super eager to jump back in. Although there is this question, like, how much of this is about culture of the military? You know, funky, funky jam dude says, do we ignore the word of these servicemen? In other words, yes, there are- Yes, 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 yes. That's but our traditional authority. No, 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 but, I want, but what I'm talking about is the culture within the armed forces. Uh, the Air Force is not gonna get out in front and say, you know, retired Navy pilots are bullshitters or are, that's, you know, I, I don't know. You, that's kind what of a- servicemen though? There's only been two or three of them. How many, there's really, they're, <laughs> they're just the same pilots. Times. Right. <laughs> Can I, can I jump in on this though? Yeah, of course, that's what I was gonna okay. ask you, Kate. So, yeah, so it, these UFO investigations that have been conducted, have always like been conducted as part of military operations, right? And it's because the, the cases that have been, or some, at least some of the cases that have been the most powerful in this field of study have been those that come from servicemen, right? And usually most often pilots, but not only pilots, right? Also radar technicians and others. Um, and I don't think that we need to summarily disregard the experiences of pilots and service people. And in fact, the Air Force for decades struggled against the stigma because they wanted their pilots to report when they had strange experiences. In fact, from a national security perspective, it is really crucial that your pilots tell you when they have yeah. some sort of experience they can't explain physiologically, um, perspectively, whatever the case may be. And so I don't think, I, I tend to approach this from a good faith position. I believe most people who make reports, pilots or otherwise, have actually had some kind of experience that they cannot explain. And I do believe that our military industrial complex has an obligation to investigate those things. Um, so I no, we shouldn't disregard the reports of pilots, but we also shouldn't immediately go to the fact that the pilots had an experience they can't explain. And so it's some sort of unknown extraterrestrial aircraft. Right? Like, I'm also not willing to make that jump. But like, I agree, we shouldn't necessarily out of hand disregard these service people. We just need to be sure that we like pump the brakes on how we're interpreting I like that. their experiences. Is, is it, is it uh, useful for me to ask you to do a bit of a thumbnail prediction of what the report that's coming out, if it comes out in June or later this summer might say? 
asking me? Yeah, let's start with you. Yeah, um, I think that if it it if it looks anything like the num the numerous reports that the various branches of the military and intelligence community have put out over the decades, that it will be a lot of here are cases, here are reports people made, here are the cases we investigated and the outcomes that we determined. Here is a small subset that remain unsolved or unknown because we don't have sufficient data to solve them. Here's the state of the investigative program. Here's the number of people working on it. Here's how much money we need to continue it. I think it will be very cut and dry. I think that it will be disappointing to a lot of the community. And I think it will be very in line with previous investigative reports. And Sarah, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, with the caveat that I have no idea because they don't let me get involved, um, I, I agree with I agree with Kate about the the general parameters of what they will probably look at. Um, I do know that uh, you have you, you know you have this uh, footage up on the screen, and we have gotten a number of uh, unauthorized releases of things that the uh, Pentagon has confirmed were part of the UAP task force investigation. Um, and so, you know, what one could infer that those will likely be part of the report um, that is put out. But it, I think it is is notable, um, and this is something that John Greenwald of the the website The Black Vault pointed out to me, that that those uh, admissions that the, that these are military videos have not, and that they were part of the UATP task force have not included the information that these were unidentified objects, just that they investigated them which could mean that as Kate was saying, you know, these are possibly cases they investigated that they then solved later. But that's not what you see in a headline. Or, or right. what you hear, or what you hear Louis Elizondo and Chris Mellon say, they'll, they'll come out and say to CNN, well, the Pentagon has admitted that UFOs are real. I've heard them say that countless times as if the subtext is, you have, this is, this is a very real phenomenon. We, we, and, and by the way, I don't think it's our technology or Russia's or the Chinese, they'll say. So, and I don't think it's ours. So what does that, where does that leave us? But, but I'm not saying it's aliens. <laughs> They're talking out of both sides of their mouth constantly. Right. Also, um, UFOs are real is kind of a, a meaningless statement because it's like yeah. objectively true that people see things that they can't identify in the sky. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything at all. Right. It's uh, this is such a remarkable um, instance of. It reminds me also of the fights over the Wuhan lab source for the virus, or is it natural? You get this motivated reasoning, people walling off information, people not really acknowledging uncertainty on the other side. Uh, many journalists are now backtracking from stories that they had originally written that were scoffing at the idea that it could possibly be the lab, and now that's more nuanced. Uh, that's a much more concept. Well, I shouldn't say it's much more consequential. <laughs> you know, if this is, if this is actually something phenomenally new and momentous, then it is very consequential. But these fights seem to play out quite frequently. So, Seth, I don't know if you're paying attention enough to have your own sense of how this could play out in the next couple of months. Yeah, I wrote an article about it actually. <laughs> but, oh, right, right. I've got it here. Yeah, but, but well, you showed it actually. But yeah, I could agree completely with Kate and with Sarah that it's going to be just like the Condon report, the Grudge report, the Sign report, you know, all of these reports, which were uh, compiled in the early 50s, they're very, very, uh, you know, there were very, very intelligent and knowledgeable people involved in that. I mean, there was the president of Caltech and stuff like that. All right. So, and what did they find? They found they could explain 90% of the sightings as, you know, just ordinary things, balloons, planes, all that sort of stuff. But there was always 10% that they couldn't explain. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen again. There's going to be a certain fraction of them where they say, we think we know what it is. And they're going to be 10 or 20% that they say, well, we're not sure of these. So everybody is going to be happy because the people who think, well, you know, this is just a lot of nonsense. Let's say, see, they still couldn't come up with anything. And the people who think that we are being visited, they'll say, see, those 10 or 20 percent, that's where the aliens are. And, you know, that's that's kind of nonsense. It's like saying, you know, the police department in New York solves 64 percent of the murders. But, the you know, what about the other 36 percent? Those are probably committed by aliens. 
And this is the same this is the same debate that the military has been having forever, right? Like every year report you mentioned sign and grudge and blue book. Every year they put out their annual reports. Every year it was we solved 97% of cases. Here are the 3% we didn't solve. The Air Force thinks that means it's a closed question, right? We solve 97% of all the sightings. The UFO crowd is saying, well, it's the 3%. And the ufologists and the professional scientists who are interested are saying, well, it's the 3% that are, that are the interesting, important cases. And there's always been that, that conflict of interpretation between these two groups. So I, there's a question I posted here from Bradley Johansson. Uh, can this fizzle out now without serious consequences? The data people want doesn't exist and won't come out. So where do the riled up UFO fans go from here. Boy, that sounds about, it, that reminds me of other riled fans who claim that election was stolen. Well, I, where, I think that's where, an excellent- where from here? Yeah. yeah, it's an excellent point that Bradley makes because in fact, they have put so much, if you will, capital, investment capital into the disclosure hypothesis. The fact that this issue is going to be solved when the government comes out and tells what it knows that if they come out and say, well, we know about some of them and not all of them, that doesn't change the situation. And that means that 10 years from now, we can have this panel again. Yeah. So Andy, I wanna pose a question to, to the folks here on the panel. Um, there, there's been some very thoughtful, you know, UFO um, folks on Twitter that I follow that that are saying, you know what, you know, we're, we're just so disgusted and confused by this soap opera. And, you know, it's incumbent on the Pentagon to just clear this up already. Because if journalists aren't gonna do a good job, if they're not gonna shine a light on this and, and try to help us understand it, and if we can't, if we can't sort of you know, sift out these, these agendas of these UFO lobbyists and, and campaigners, then, then shouldn't, the, shouldn't the Pentagon just come in and say, instead of just saying, well, we, we, yes, you know, we're, we, we're admitting that these UFOs exist, these, these videos and pictures were taken, from the cockpit, you know, of a, of a Navy fighter pilot, and um, and here's what it was. I mean, don't should we should they just come out and and just give us some clarity? And I and I think you know some folks have been saying that and saying it's really enough enough's enough already. Why don't why don't they just do that? You know, with these videos, I I mean, I firmly believe. I don't know how you folks believe. I firmly believe that they they know, you know, what these videos are. They know exactly yeah. what they are. So why not just come out? Why let it fester? Why let well, this, that, why, why do this? I do think that's, that's where this gets into the issue of the Pentagon being so uh, miserly about information about it's the state of its systems. You know, they, they don't want to be portraying themselves as unable to interpret these signals. Um, so they're going to end up always hiding. They're not going to say they know because then Russia and China will know the limits or capacities we have. So strategically, I think they're sort of stuck too, unless I'm missing something. Sarah, I don't know if that has come up in your reporting. Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the UFO waters have generally, um, and Kate can, can speak much more knowledgeably to this, but have always been muddy. And um, it, it is, if, if, agencies or organizations are keeping things uncertain that they theoretically could clarify, that means that it is generally probably in their interest to do so, whether for the Pentagon, if that's some national security interest, like you mentioned, or the people on the other side in the, in the private sector calling for information to come out, but not providing maybe all of the information that they have that could, could clarify things. And um, uh, I think it, UFOs have in part been able to sustain interest in themselves for so long because they are a mystery that you never solve. Um, they just keep right. on being a big old question mark and we're just, that's uh, that's also a history repeating itself. I hit the button too quickly. I was gonna show this case study. So just while I have it up, I didn't wanna interrupt the flow there, and but I did this accidentally. In 1996, I was one of the Times team spent months reporting on the destruction of Flight 800 off of Long Island. And all kinds of narratives were built around this, including our newsroom narrative was it had to be terrorism. The Atlanta bombing had happened. There was a Filipino attack on an airliner using a small bomb. And we were dug in and I've watched the narratives peel away. As a reporter, the stuff coming out of the, I took that picture and the assembled 
in the warehouse where they finally let us in to see the assembled wreckage. And the metallurgists who had been studying every piece of wreckage for, for weeks and weeks saw no evidence of a bomb or explosive force. And, and I was pummeled and pummeled and pummeled relentlessly pre-social pre media by conspiracists who were convinced it was a guided missile cruiser that had accidentally fired a missile, which gets so much in some of the dynamics that are here now. The CIA, you know, they did a, um, a, re a reconstruction based on thousands, hundreds of witnesses. And in the end, it's like, it's too complicated. No one actually, when the NTSB, the safety board finally did this, the summary result on this flight, it was all putative. Some combination of a spark and an empty gas tank, et cetera, et cetera, took down the plane. And it's still, as you were saying just now about UFOs, it lingers in that space where even the last five years have been documentaries alleging this is a cover up. So I'm not confident, like some of you, I'm not confident that we're gonna get past this point of these intense conversations. I think I it know. also doesn't help that, I shouldn't say doesn't help. I think to, to speak further to Sarah's point, um, Sometimes people see, like, the things that people see are real. Like, there are real things out there. The CIA in the 90s took responsibility, almost gleefully, it seemed, for a vast majority of UFO sightings being the U-2 spy plane test flights. Like, people were seeing stuff that was really up there. The same thing with surveillance balloons, drones, and all kinds of craft. And I think, A, to the first point about the government, even the Pentagon now, they will identify things and they will not share with us what those things are. They don't want our adversaries on the global stage to know that we know as much as we know or don't know, for example. Um, but also sometimes sometimes people see stuff and, and they're not only like, are their perceived experiences real, but the thing that is out there that they're seeing is also real. Um, and that, that gives them a particular kind of staying power as well, if you will. Well, maybe just one last reflection from each of you on, in a wishful way, what you would hope this discussion might look like in, let's say, five years. Maybe, Seth, are we not paying enough attention to your realm? Or, you know, are we not paying enough attention to pandemic preparedness? <laughs> well, I well, yeah, Sarah, I'll, Ahmad, uh, maybe. For me, a good point. He says, if only we had a little more enthusiasm for SETI, which is, you know, right. run on a shoestring. The total number of people doing SETI, you know, as a full-time occupation is more or less, exactly, is more or less equal to the number of people on this panel. But uh, the UFO community, remember, one-third of Americans believe that there's truth in the UFO claims. So 100 million Americans think that there's something buzzing our skies, even though it has no practical consequences whatsoever, either on air traffic or, well, it does have one practical consequence. It, uh, the History Channel has a lot of shows about aliens. <laughs> so it has that. And so maybe this is just like Santa Claus, right? It's uh, going to be in the popular culture forever. I can imagine that. But as the years go on, and we fail to have the kind of evidence that you could put in a science museum, because we don't have that, right? If, if it ever got to that, then I might change my mind. But since we don't have that, I can well imagine that this story is so compelling that it'll go on forever. Well, especially with our media environment. So anyway, a last thought on this from, from each of you, perhaps. Um, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. So we I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, sometimes I wake up and I think that, yes, when I see the latest UFO headlines. Um, I, 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 I sort of agree with Seth. And I, I, somebody, Sorry, that's it's an alien calling. It's that's just a little it. guy here. He's very short and has so no hair. <laughs> He's my, green. That's my final thought. No, I, I, I think this is all cyclical. I think that we we do see if we you know, I've been studying the the history of, of journalism and UFOs now for a number of years, and I see the cycles play out every few years or several times a decade. And you have these waves of interest. It is a, the difference now being is that it's been covered so uh, extraordinarily by our by prestige media whereas before it was really the right. domain of the national Enquirer or maybe some local papers wire services that sort of thing so this is there is there is a little bit of a difference to the coverage today but I I, I see this fizzling out I do I don't I think you know we 
it, you know, in journalism, you know, uh, news is about what's new. So there's only so many times you can recycle the same video. I think it's going to get old. I do think this is going to play out. They'll have some more news pegs coming up with this, you know, uh, report from the Pentagon delivered to Congress. And, and then I don't know how it generates itself unless you have, you know, more people coming forward, other pilots. I don't know. I see it fizzling out and see it, I see it, you know, there being some new, uh, something new in, in, the, in the air or the water that surfaces to give us a whole nother wave in five or 10 years, so. Well, I, it would be weird if whatever that new thing ends up with its own political action committee. <laughs> <laughs> like you have- The aliens now. are gonna have their own, they have their own uh, action committee, wow. Kind of wild. Well, it's been, I, I, by the way, I, I didn't get the last thought from Sarah or and maybe Kate, I can't remember Kate if you, you chimed in. So any- well, I can just add real wish. quick that I don't expect it to go away. I think it, to Keith's point, there are peaks and troughs. Uh, this will bottom out at some point, but then we will get another bump up. And my hope is that um, we will all learn something from this. I think that UFOs, they really capture everyone's imaginations as is being demonstrated. Like we're here having this conversation yeah. right now. It means something. Um, and they're a really excellent opportunity to have, to do really good science communication, for example, or for us to have conversations about like who we're trusting and not trusting, how forthcoming the government is being. And these questions about credibility and trust and trusting our government or our institutions are, I think the pandemic has shown us, if nothing else, are like really crucial. And so I hope that we can take advantage of this situation and of UFOs to do some of this more really vital for the democracy kind of communication work. Well, I'm with you and thank you all for being here today. Um, I think this was a, a useful discussion of what to think and do in the face of uncertainty of lots of motivations clashing in the face of our new emerging media environment, which unfortunately for the time being, it seems set up to mostly take us in the wrong direction on issues like this. And so again, thanks for being here today. Uh, Sarah Scholes, Seth Shostak, Keith Kluwer, my old friend from so many years, and uh, Kate Dorsch. And I'm Andy Revkin at the Earth Institute of Columbia University, also the Climate School, trying to make a little bit more sense each day on these conversations of how to think about the world when complexity and consequence collide. Uh, there's lots more shows coming up. Sunday is our usual arts show, which this weekend will focus on Memorial Day songs and poetry. And this has been captured by UFO Mania. Again, thanks for being here. Share this as soon as we're done. Get in touch with me via the information in that distracting scrolling bar at the bottom. And have a good weekend. <laughs> thanks, Andy. Thanks for doing thanks, it. Thank you.